Witches and mortals seldom do mix, but when mixed marriage is on the cards, Insanity pursues with the classic 60s sitcom Bewitched with your co-hosts Vicky Ray, Jesse Fultz, and Keith Chowdhill. Witches have never been so exposed before. And take it from me, I'm Uncle Arthur Sandy. Hello, welcome to Let Your License Podcast, and it's Bewitch Week. We'll be discussing episodes 29 through 37. And before we get started, let's find out who's with us. we got Vicky Ray with us. Hello, Vicky. Hi, guys. And Jesse Fultz. Hello, Jesse. Hey, everybody. How's it going? And I'm Keith Shago. Before we get started, let's find out what we've been up to since last time we spoke to each other. Starting with you, Jesse, what have you been up to? Uh, besides school... <laughs> Nothing. Much, just school. We just had this conversation. <laughs> yeah, school and uh, what else? Um, school. You finished your play. School. Someone gave yeah, you a I nice little play, which is... memor- memorandum from it. You just showed yeah. me. Yeah, that was nice. Um, honestly, I kind of missed the play, even though it gave me extra to do because I don't have any. Um, well, can't you do others? That sounds like you really liked it. I did, yeah. It was fun. And then the last, then, uh, I'm trying to remember the next show that we have is called like Life Spirit, but they didn't have anyone that was my age that they needed. It was all older people, which I'm sad about because I, it's so interesting. I don't know if either of you have heard of it, but I didn't but, hear about it before. But it's so interesting about like, um, like a Victorian kind of spirit. What is it? Um, it's like a Victorian era, um, play about like spirits and like seances and stuff Ooh, that sounds cool what's it called blood spirit blood spirit blythe blight uh, spirit no oh. no cow it's an old coward play oh mm-hmm. i've never heard of it there's a movie with um maggie smith in it really what's it called again because you know i gotta look this stuff up after i get off the blight spirit oh okay yeah y t h e it kind of kind of sounded like the woman in black there for a second, kind of sort of, but I guess not, right? I guess the best the black the scariest play I ever saw was Woman in Black on stage. There's only two guys, and that's it. What was it? Woman in Black on stage. They do every they do everything on stage now. I wish that they um, would come to Dallas so I could see some of stuff. the stuff. Um, this was way before the movie. So it was a and play basically- first. It was a play first, yeah. I didn't know that. How cool. So, but yeah, I mean, I just remember just sitting there and basically these two guys and are talking and all of a sudden, they, all of a sudden you hear this screeching and all of a sudden it's like this rocking chair appears with this old lady and next thing you know, this old lady's like right next to you. <laughs> <laughs> that <laughs> movie scared the shit out of me. Movies like that without the gore, oddly enough, actually jump scare me and scare mm-hmm. me What's more. What's the name than- of that one again? The gory stuff. The woman in black. Woman in black. black. Oh, with Daniel Radcliffe? Yeah, no. Oh, it was yeah. a play first. It was a play first, he said. Oh, so it was, was the play was scarier than the film? Oh, yeah, a lot scarier, yeah. Because I watched the film, and I was not very impressed with it, so I never watched the second one, because I didn't really I didn't care for the, the first one. one. I'm, I'm always looking for a scary ghost film, because ghosts are genuinely scary and terrifying, but in the movies, they are never that. I, I've never watched like a, a ghost movie or TV show that I've actually been genuinely terrified by. And it's really jump scared. I'm trying to think of the last one. Yeah. Someone, Joe told, told me to watch something that jump scares. It actually made me jump quite a few times. Now I can't remember which one it was. Well, the one, the stuff, the movie that we're covering next week, the changelings, very good. Ghost oh story. God. I love that movie. Oh, I can't wait like to it. talk about that one. Excellent. Great. Excellent. It'd be a great podcast next week. Full yeah. house. Yeah. Oh wow! Just doing it. We're doing the fog as well. The fog's also a ghost story, but um, it's a, a little bit different. They both kind of deal with the revenge, though. So, they t- they t- yeah, they they're both revenge. Fight. I mean, think of the fog. That's definitely a revenge film because those guys were pissed. They took their goal. Yeah, I didn't like the newer version though. I tried really hard to like it. I sat through it once or twice, and it just didn't. You didn't have John Hausman telling the story in the beginning, which really so. sets the tone, you know? Yeah. The thing is, you're going to do a ghost story. You can't really do like the conjuring or anything like that. You have to, you have to base everything on atmosphere. 
Yes. Exactly, because that's what it is. All based and, on yeah. so If honestly. you're thinking about, yeah, if you're thinking about how like people experience ghost activity and what terrifies people the most, you do kind of have to portray those things in a way that is perceptive to the audience because you're depicting something that people typically only feel with their senses, something that you can't see and trying to make that evident on screen, but that's almost next to impossible and everyone has their own way of doing it, but that doesn't make it very scary. I don't know. I'm trying to think of any scary ghost movie that I've seen, but I don't think I've seen any. <laughs> I've seen so many now. I don't even know. I'm so desensitized. Well, the haunt like, thing's very good. It's good, it but is it scary? Because mind. I think it's good and it's atmospheric, but I, is it is it scary? Um, well, like it's scary because you don't really know if if what what they're experiencing is real. So you're all you know, you just it's all going by. You know, is this woman going mad or is, is she really experiencing something? That's what the haunting is. The others with Nicole Kidman's very good as well. That's another good ghost. Story. That's an excellent. Oh, yeah, I've seen that. Nicole Kidman's always good, but I, I, I don't know if you've seen uh, or heard anything about uh, what is it called? Something about the Ricardos. Um, Nicole Kidman's playing Lucille Ball, which I thought was the strangest choice. Not because Nicole Kidman's a bad actor, but she doesn't act or feel or look anything like Lucille Ball. And there's other actors. She's got she's team. got a little bit of it going on, I think. I I, I Maybe. think. I don't know. I just... there's, so, so there's so much Botox. It's really hard for her to emit emotion. Not yeah. everybody has Botox. She has Botox. Come on. Her face is like really stretched. I mean, we're talking about. Yeah, that's her. true. It doesn't move. Oh, did anyone see? An eyebrow. Have you ever? Have yeah. you? If you can name one movie or one thing that you see Nicole Kidman where she was able to raise an eyebrow, ever. Mm, Besides I'd Bewitched? Or like Practical Maybe, Magic no, or something? Not really. that was that, that's not, um, the, I think the only time she was able to raise an eyebrow is before she married Tom Cruise when she did um, <laughs> Dead Calm and Days of Thunder. Days of like Thunder, yeah. Mountain. That was almost 30 years ago. She didn't need to get Botox back then. She had a different face I wish she would have kept her hair, too, because I, I liked her red hair. I, I mean, that was pretty hair. badass. Loved her hair. She's bringing, I, yeah, I don't know. She was, she was busy when she first started. <laughs> <laughs> Did anyone see My Perfect Strangers? What's it, My Perfect Strangers? Nine. Nine. No, nope, I've never heard of it. It's good. It's a show that just came out. It's like a funny, weird, psychedelic. I don't know how to describe it. It's so bizarre. But Nicole Kidman plays the lead. She's like this Russian. Um, I don't know. She's in charge of like these kind of therapy houses called um, ventri- ventri- ven- What is it called? Ventriloquist. Tranquillum. 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 Not, has, yeah, like tranquil and it's supposed to help people heal and stuff and everyone deals with their trauma and she like it does things to them um that kind of is maybe sort of illegal maybe, maybe sort of but it's a really good show it's super fascinating right uh, it's on it's on over here on amazon so i'll check that out so i think a lot of stuff i need to check out and what about your stuff vix what are you even up to oh nothing much um uh, just uh, getting ready for the holidays, actually. Trying to, still picking up from that windstorm we had the other day ago. I did finish um, watching Stranger Things finally. I'm kind of really hoping they don't leave us like that and they're going to do a fourth season. I haven't the seen where... season's out in um, January. I'm still waiting for the boys to come back out. Mm, Stuff like an, that. That's done. That's just an editing at the moment, so... Right. I got to catch up on Riverdale. I, I I didn't know the fifth season was out. I guess it's on. Um, you watch that? Yes, I do. I'm a big baby. You know that. I finally caught up with all the Yellowstone, so I'm happy. Love Yellowstone. Got to watch that now. And uh, other than that, we're just, you know, surviving, you know, the <laughs> the big crises in America the best we can. <laughs> but uh, it's all good. You know, catching up from Dark Shadows. I'm really enjoying that 1897 storyline quite a bit. So, well, myself, um, I'm coming up to the end of watching. I saw what you did last summer, the TV series, which is really good. I didn't even know they had a TV series. Amazon original. So, um, I'll check that very, out. Very, very I like their originals. Series. They've actually had some really good originals. It's quite gory, but it's good. 
the gorier, the better. That means I'll watch it. <laughs> yeah. it's all set po- it's I all wish set Sabrina would have ended that way. It's quite interesting. The twists and turns are really well done. And it's a lot, it's a lot better. I, to be honest, it's better than the movie sort of thing. I think they based it more on the book. So, so that's quite good. Dexter came back. So I'm watching Dexter now. So that's come back after 15 years off being off the air. So the new series is out now. So no kidding. I've got a whole list of stuff that I, I mean, people would give me ideas in all these forums that I've got a list. You know, I, I used to think Halloween was where you had the list. No, it's Christmas time where you really get the real list. Only mm-hmm. amateurs get the Halloween list. <laughs> well, another thing we have over here in Shutter that we're watching is um, Dragula. And it's kind of oh, like, I saw that. I was going to start watching it. I haven't started watching it. I figured you would. Ru- Do you like it? Well, it's RuPaul's drag race for the grotesque. Yeah. So basically, it's all like blood and guts and horror. It's hor- drag queen to do horror. So it's, yeah, it's, that's how they call it. Very original. Um, that's the thing say. It's unfiltered. So basically, you kind of get the contestants in their real their you know, rawness. Like, yeah, they're not very nice people. They're very confrontational. There's a lot of swearing. Everything well, they do everything, but basically beat each other up. So, so well, but, they do get rather is- bitchy. <laughs> <laughs> but they also do nods to like a lot of stuff like they did heavy metal on this this week but then they'll do a nod to like psycho beach party movies from the 60s and right you know, so they, they have like little themes and stuff like that and it's all quite done but the set that they use kind of will mind your monster movie matinee they'll be like really going into the house where it's all like a model like like in the old like monster movie matinee so it's quite cool so they've got that on youtube if you look it up the old guy with the patch and stuff and they got that little house that sits up on the that whatever that was they got the music and the the fake fog and that just brings (laughs) back so many memories god i like just wish i could go back to those days i want to sit on my mother's couch and not have any responsibility (laughs) <laughs> and then um, I guess there's a likelihood that Elvira is going to be doing an interview with us. So it's, it's, <gasps> yeah, no, that's the, yeah, are you serious? It, oh, that's great. So we'll starting see. that out at the moment, and then starting out bits and bobs and um, all that sort of stuff. So that's pretty much it, really. I would love to be there for that, even if I just sat in and didn't ask any questions. I would just, that'd be awesome. <laughs> I just want to be there. <laughs> I bet you she's a real fun interview. I'm looking forward to that if she does. Mm -hmm. So now this brings us to Bewitch. And our first episode is episode 29, which is called Disappearing Samantha. Samantha uses her powers to embrace, to embarrass Professor Wit Debunker. Osgood Rockmeyer, played by Bernard Fox, who then unknowingly employs an amateur spell to make her disappear. Luckily, her disappearance is only temporary, but unluckily, her disappearance happens again and again against her will. Not paying attention, neither Darren or Samantha can remember the incantation, so Endura doesn't know how to solve the problem. It turns out that he unknowingly had an ancient talisman that allowed him to perform the magic. Foster Brooks appears as Robert Andrews as editor of the magazine, interested in doing an article about Osgood and Nina Wayne guest stars. Isn't that this the is young girl? January 27th, 1966. It was the last appearance featuring Irene Vernon as Louise Tate, and Fox will be cast as Dr. Bombay starting in season yeah, three. That's how I was saying it was Dr. Bombay. Was um was uh Nina Wayne who was Nina Wayne playing? She was the wife of the um advertiser. Oh she no, she oh, was the Larry's Jimbo. wife. The bim- no, the bimbo girl. Okay, the bimbo girl. Okay, I was trying to figure out because she did so well at being the bimbo. <laughs> I mean, she was just, True. you know, it, it, they, they say so much with, about that little, that one little flirtation without saying too much. <laughs> Basically, he's a dirty old man is what it boils down to. But they don't really Or how she say kept that. calling him Mr. Um, Uncle. Uncle, Mr. too. Uh, Uncle. Uncle. What was she called? Well, Uncle, what the heck was she called? She kept calling them different names. He, he kept wanting yeah, that's to call, what she he did. Kept wanting her Mr. To call Uncle. Him Uncle. But she kept saying Mr. So it was causing the um, facade to slip. And he was annoyed by that. Yeah. Mm. I got a kick out of this one, actually. Because really uh, 
because she, well, she was, she thought it was, they were laughing in the audience and who'd have thought that he was actually a witch finder, you know, when you think of witch finder, I'm thinking of Vincent Price, not Dr. Bombay type people. So, yeah. you know, and then he comes up with this weird ass incantation, you know, and then she starts disappearing. Everything always is so inopportune. Yeah. <laughs> it's just inopportune, all of it. I also like the fact that he says it in front of an door and she disappears. That was quite funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And she's supposed to be one of the baddest ass witches going. She's powerful. Exactly. I, I like how they figured that out, though. That was so clever. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I thought that episode was really interesting, um, but I thought there was something to it because that guy obviously didn't know what the hell he was doing. He was a total buffoon and didn't even have his information right. Um, and yeah, that whole ring incident was really They had to get the to ring off of And the ring rolls all the way to the kitchen, right? Yeah. Because they have, to, like take, they they have, they have to get the ring from him. Yeah. It's just like, you know, you had to wonder, it's just like, well, I guess it's because it's a sitcom, there's no common sense, basically. So you have to remember that, you know, when he, when he drops his ring, it doesn't actually roll all the way into the yeah. kitchen. <laughs> but I, I think it's interesting well, that, um, like, Endora always takes, or Agnes Moorhead, I should say, really makes silly moments like this seem like really compelling, even though it's just a really silly idea. She it's has such so a strong presence in any I know, episode. She just stands just there and she has a strong presence. Yeah. I know. It's just, it's crazy because I was watching it. I'm like, wow. They, I mean, this seems like such a silly episode, but like her and Samantha really make it work somehow. And I just thought that was kind of impressive because like, if you took any other actors and put this in a TV show now, I would have a hard time like buying any of it <laughs> just because the acting it would probably be as atrocious as the story. Well, it was line. a different time in a different True. world. I don't even know if that kind of sitcom would translate well into this century or, you know, decade, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, I think what keeps the witch strong is basically they, they, their love of character actors. I mean, the whole show. Oh, yeah. I mean, God, yeah. Character actors. It's I mean. a hit parade of character actors. Then you're yeah. right. That, that, that's a really good point. Because their character actors make up the show for the most part. Yeah. You've, no, got, the main, you you've got the at, main schematic but between Darren and Samantha. Even if you look at Montgomery and you look at um, Dick York, I mean, they were never, they were never Hollywood starlets. Or, um, no. Actors. They were character actors. If you look at, you know, even if you look at her stuff that she did before Bewitched, whether it was Twilight Zone or whether it was Outer yeah. Limits or something like that, they're all character actor parts that she's ever played. Her father was a movie star, but she was a character mm-hmm. actress. So um, I also quite like um, when um, Andorra's doing the research and she's got the old dusty spell book out and then she's like, yeah. oh, it's not in here. I'm I need to borrow from from my, my, my <laughs> all the old books that pop up. That was quite funny. <laughs> the dusty she spell book. To leave. <laughs> so, but, yeah, I was yeah, expecting that, her to vanish and like strong. go and pull a book up, but she brought the whole library basically to her. <laughs> <laughs> and Darren and Endora and Samantha are all get on. We're all getting on in this episode as well. I quite like. I like it when um, they kind of break the norm with the mother-in-law, son-in-law situation because you see that in everything well because they have a common Mm -hmm. enemy you know and a common interest at least at this point it is kind of annoying to constantly see i mean even when you rather you're seeing like whether it's friends or any sitcom today you always have the mother-in-law son-in-law scenario situation or the the daughter-in-law mother-in-law scenario that's well there is a dynamic there you know i mean it, it it sometimes there is friction i've seen that but when you get them playing, but when you get them like getting on, it just kind of makes it different. It kind of breaks, nothing you know, brings enemies really together different. like a common foe. Yeah, it's, it's nice because it does disrupt the like monotony of having Darren and Andorra always at odds, and then you get to focus on a different element of the story and something newer rather than constantly having them being at odds with the story because that gets a little frustrating and feels kind of. It's overdone sometimes. sometimes. Yeah, it, sometimes. And I think in season two, we've got we've gotten a lot of that kind of storylines as well so far in these episodes. So I think so. It's been quite good. This brings us to episode 30, Follow That Witch, part one. 
Darren pitches a campaign to Mr. Robbins, played by Jack Collins, the president of a baby food company. Mr. Robin wants to sign with Darren. The company's advertising manager, George Barkley, played by Stephen Franken, hires a private detective named Charlie Leach, played by Robert Strauss, to learn more about Darren's home life. Mr. Leach catches Samantha using her powers and tends to blackmail her. Virginia Martin also guest stars as Leach's wife. This was filmed on February 17, 1966, and due to Alice Pierce's illness at the time of filming, she died a few weeks later. Marty Grace Confield makes her first appearance as Harriet Kravitz, who is said to be keeping house for her brother Abner while Gladys is visiting her mother. So it is her brother. That confused me there for a while. I meant to look it up the other day and go, Harriet, Harriet in her own rights are real so-and-so too, isn't it? What is it? That this the women that surround much. Abner all bitches and, and nosy people or what? Bodies. Well, the weird thing about it, um, I think she's brilliant. I love her. I think she's I love bad. her. Yeah, that's something I actually, but it does make it look like Abner married his sister when he married Gladys because Gladys and this um, Harriet look a lot alike. Yeah, there's so many similarities. The way that the, no. the way everything goes, sort of thing. I almost, I almost wish they would have picked her to be the new Gladys instead of the one, the one that they ended up with because she is so similar and carries that similarity. In her character it's just such a shame that she passed away though i know she, it really is sad i i didn't have any idea for the longest time she's well, like she's the best but one. It, it paints things kind of, but it, i have to say but having harry in there and seeing who she is and how she acts and so like this it's it adds a new dimension to abner because like abner married someone who's like his sister which is kind of weird <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's true. I didn't even think of that till you just said it. So, yeah, so he's probably used to have a nosy so and so's in his family, and that's probably why he did pick her because even she like is la- like, even like the lack of a chin. Because Gladys, I mean, Gladys has a lot, she has no chin, does she? Her chin, no. her face, you know, let's go, go, go kind of get swallowed up. Yeah, because she, she has a massive overbite. That's probably what it is. <laughs> and, th- and this one, too. This one as well. This is like, God. <laughs> The first time I thought she was like, when she first appeared, I thought maybe she's glad she's sister. But then when she just sees Abner's sister, I'm like, what? <laughs> okay. Yeah, that was weird. That was weird. This is very and It's just amazing how across. everybody hooks up with the person that wants to make trouble for the Stevens family across the road. I, I mean, so... it's just like, you know, don't people mind their own business? It's like, leave them alone. But she, Very but nice. she's she's one going over there already with her cup for her sugar and making. She's always got that pot in her hand, that saucepan. Yeah. <laughs> it's like <laughs> she's you're trying to turn that saucepan all the time. It seems. I mean, as far as the blackmail thing goes, it's kind of like um, it's kind of odd. I going to say the whole episode itself. Yeah, it the is blackmail. because I mean. It, we're seriously, why would he blackmail her? Because Samantha could just pop him into oblivion. You should just get rid of him for one. The most I, know, I, I was kind of surprised that, that it is, I found the most interesting thing about that whole um, situation is I love Charlie Leaps, the blackmailer's wife. I think she was brilliant. Oh, God, she's great. Yeah, she's, she's better so in this sarcastic role than in the magician's uh, girlfriend role. Yeah. Well, they're married, but she's so sarcastic. You know, she wants furs and jewelry and stuff. And here she is married to this heel that just can't seem to get it going. And he gets fired. I don't know why. Time. And but now he's gone bad me, shit. <laughs> she reminds me of like a character from like Popeye or Betty Boop or something. I, I don't know why. She Betty just, Boop she feels, more. Maybe Betty Boop. Yeah. Maybe Betty Boop. <laughs> I just thought it seemed so funny. She seemed like a Flapperish. villain from like one of those um those old cartoons it was uh very it was an interesting dynamic well she's also like the tv version of like um well who is it i'm thinking of betty hutton as well you know from annie get your gun in those old 1930s and 40s movies mm-hmm. you know that the blonde wacky one also the one born yes um judy holiday she reminded me of judy holiday like a tv version of her as well and she has movie. like she has like this slight kind of uh gangster her accents too which makes her feel like she'd be like the wife of a gangster or a boxer or just some kind of leech that would oh yeah she looks like something you'd see out walking out of a prohibition bar kind of <laughs> situation mm-hmm. with a gun toting you know whatever she does seem like a gun mall she does he's that's for sure it. he's seeing it family <laughs> <laughs> the neener, neener. Every time he comes in, no matter what time of day, she's in bed. I was like, he woke me up. 
<laughs> I know she's lazy. Obviously, she's not useful around the house. And she drinks. Yeah. Yeah. Well, apparently he does, too, because he's, he's always coming home with a wild story. She don't buy it anymore. But, you know, then you just they, she kept what's it, they kept, what did he catch her doing? What was Samantha doing when he caught her? Was it the chair? She made the yeah, chair little, know. right? The rocking chair little that she was painting. I mean, I have to sit there and say it was good to see Steve Franken. Yes. What else has he been in? Oh, uh, he was in. I mean, he just appears like time travelers. He did. Yeah. The many, Life, the many loves of Dobie Gillis. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Harry Mason, the lieutenant. He was pretty. He was a pretty. Uh, he really was hitting the TV circuit back in the day. And then he just kind of fell out of. Well, out he of appeared sight. in six episodes of Bewitched. So this is the first time we see him. But he's just yeah. one of those people that it just it always appears. Love American style, Adam 12. I mean, Barney Miller, <laughs> you name it, he's done it. Yeah. He, probably he always a plays a weird TV trouble. actor, always a TV actor. Yeah, I guess. Uh, the funny thing about him is that his. Um, his career carried on quite a long time because he would appear, um, if he died in 2012, but he appeared in, even he was working like in Molly Brown, Ma, uh, Murphy Brown and um, the Kings of Queens and Seinfeld he appeared in, and, you know, and he was even the voice to, in Batman, the animated series as well. So, so he's, he was around for quite a while, but, um, but it's always quite good when you see someone like that. Cause you never, quite, he's like, Oh, I know him. And then it's like, and then you start thinking like, Oh my God! Yes, yes, yes! And you realize like he's part of your TV landscape. <laughs> yes, yeah. That that's and there's so many of them you can't really remember who they are or what they did, but you know the face because they've been on all these sitcoms like F Troop and stuff like that. You know, yeah. I mean, a lot of people don't even remember F Troop. And uh, well, I think that's one of those. I mean, that's why I quite miss is Nick at Night, wasn't it? Nick at Night was quite good in this day, like in the '90s, where they were playing all these old TV series, and it's like. They yeah. think it's called TV Land over here. I think they got it. I think Nick at Night plays. I just haven't seen any of that on Nick at Night, but I know we have TV Land and and there's yeah, like a wild, million like, channels like, now. I Dream of Jeannie and Partridge Family and Brady yeah. Bun. I Married Joan and all those sort of things. But the Honeymooners <laughs> and all that sort of stuff. And all the good old ones. I mean, overall, I mean, this is an okay episode, but you know, it does make me wonder why we need a part two, which is basically episode. So 31, which is follow. Yeah. Follow part two. Um, pri- um, private investigator Charles Charlie Leach tells Samantha that he has proof that she is a witch. He says he will tell Darren's client Robin's baby food unless Samantha gives him several expensive gifts. Darren finds out about the fact that Leach was hired by Robin's baby food. Samantha and Darren go to give Robin's and Barkley a piece of her, their mind, and Darren winds up getting the account. Darren gives Samantha permission to twitch to teach Charlie lesson. Yeah, this is one of these, um, and I'll, you know, I'll continue with this one. This is kind of like, okay, we got a two-parter. Why? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe, yeah. maybe they were just, maybe it was filler. You know, maybe they elongated this episode. For a reason but i mean it, it's really all boils down to the the guy being hired because the baby food company person that's overseeing the account wants to make sure that they're wholesome people that are you know going to represent the baby food company but apparently the guy who owns the company had no idea that this was going on mm-hmm. anyway but you know i mean it, it, it to something about i mean I, I don't get me wrong i like the episode but just Black uh, blackmailing a witch with that kind of power, it just doesn't seem like it's possible. I mean, she screws with him, but I mean, not enough to get rid of him completely because he does show up again. <laughs> I know there's situations in I Dream of Jeannie where Jeannie links Major Healy in, onto like Mount Everest and he <laughs> has to come back and back and he doesn't get his way. It's just weird that she can't find a way out of it. I mean, I thought it was a good episode. Like if you don't think about it so much, but then after you think about it, it's just kind of like, but why? Cause it has like this kind of weird private. I mean, he's, he's a 
terrible private eye. But then eye, again, but... like my mom always tells me, it's Hollywood. You're not supposed to think about those things. It's just exactly. entertaining. Exactly. Run they don't it, think it, you know? They don't think about it when they're creating the stuff, especially, I mean, you think they would now because information is so easy to come by now, but they don't. I think they think a little less than they did with the show. <laughs> which, to well, be honest, it was a different is, world, you know, though. more compelling. I mean, yeah, that's why I, mean, I always have to tell myself it was a different time and a different world and, you know. Well, I, I, think, the, I think the problem basically is that um, this is not the end of Charlie Leach, which we'll cover in the next couple of, in the next couple of episodes. We'll, we'll yeah, see. which I was surprised by. I mean, it's so soon. It's not like a season down the line. It's like a few episodes down the yeah, line. Yeah, he comes right back. <laughs> I mean, yeah. how, do you get, how do you get from Mexico so fast? I know, but I mean, well, seriously, Samantha is really a nice person, basically. She made him walk all the way from Mexico or whatever, you know. And I just realized they're in New York State. They're not in Connecticut. I didn't know this. They keep, it's just so many things keep showing up that I realized because now he's yeah. seeing the sign to New York. So they're in New York. We once thought they were in California or Connecticut or New England, but they are in New York, right? Yeah, Did anybody the, catch that? It's the funniest weather that you're ever going to experience, only on Bewitched. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, all's well that ends well. You know, he gets the account, as per usual, and no one figures out what Samantha is. And the bad guy gets sent to Mexico, and, you know, God only knows what his wife's going to do to him when he gets home. Because he doesn't have any money. <laughs> But this poor guy yeah, just, I just... I mean, I just can't imagine to blackmail a witch is the best thing to do. Because, I mean, I, all she has to do is twitch her nose and that's it. it she, turn, she can turn it into any animal she wants to. I know. It just didn't, didn't seem do that. logical. It just didn't seem yeah. logical. The next episode is Bum Raps, which is episode 32. Samantha is expecting the arrival of Darren's Uncle Elbert, who she has never met. She mistakes Horace Dilway, played by Cliff Hall, ex of the vaudeville team of Dilway and Dunn, for Elbert. Both Horace and his still partner, William Dunn, played by Herbie Fay, are now hobos that sponge free meals. William believes they have the perfect opportunity to rob the Stevensons, but Horace doesn't want to as he has become fond of Samantha. She soon finds out that Horace is not Uncle Elbert, but lets him play anyway. The pair go through with the robbery, but Horace has a change of heart. I liked this episode. Yeah. I thought it was kind of, eh, the little old man in it, and there was a little humanity to be seen. And, you know, I know Jesse's giving me that face. Go ahead, Jess. Let me have it. I liked it too, but it also infuriated me because they totally ignored and dropped Uncle Albert. And there, there was absolutely oh yeah, no we never found out what happened, to Uncle Albert. He you don't died know what heart attack. And the lack knowing. of concern was kind of just frustrating to me. Like we don't know. But you're what not happened supposed to, him. to think about that. We don't know how far he traveled from. Like there was no consideration for the real Uncle Albert. Well, and Darren like, didn't seem upset either. I know that was annoying to me. I'm like, oh my god, this is so infuriating. And I, I've never been so like, oh, cute. And then also like infuriated at the same time as much as this episode did that to me. It was like bizarre. It was a really bizarre mixture <laughs> of being a good episode, but then all, also being terrible and dropping the ball in that one specific area where there was no resolution even at the end of the episode. And it's like, okay, you know that this guy is a homeless dude or whatever, um, a pan peddler as uh, what's her face. Um, Miss Kravitz calls him. And uh, it was just so frustrating to me that they ignored that. And, and well, another thing is, if they're, if they're hobos, right? Apparently they're homeless hobos. Well, they were dressed kind of okay for hobos. Yeah, and but they if they are everyone hobos, dressed nice. I mean, wouldn't Samantha <laughs> be able to smell them a mile away? <laughs> oh, no, no. Well, he was a nice a really old man, nice and he was... Fountain. He was his sweet. He was singing to her baby and everything else. I mean, you know. You know, the only thing I can pick apart about this, I kind of, I think the the actors playing the vaudeville team, um, Dilway and Dunn, I think they were good. But it would have been nice to have some old classic actors, you know, like maybe Red Buttons and you know what I mean? Or Yeah, I would have loved to see Red Buttons do it. You know, and, you know, some of those old, you know, old thing or something like that would have been really would have been really fun actually but i mean i think these two were really good but i just think if they had a little bit of um 
you know, Buster Keaton and someone. You know what I mean? It's just someone that you can just go, oh, sort of thing. Let's see, the 20s. When did Vaudeville die out? Early 30s? Mid 30s? Yeah, early 30s. That's not, then turning over to Berlaston, and that's when um, Gypsy Rose Lee made her heyday after that. So, yeah. yeah. Also, Uncle Albert was supposed to call, and he never did. He didn't call. It, it would have been easy to make a call that same day from someplace, man, rather than a cell phone well, back then. But the vase, though, because late in one of the other episodes, she actually breaks the breaks the vase, and Darren catches it, putting it back together. She goes, she goes "That was Uncle Al- Uncle Albert. Albert gave us that vase, and he appeared at some point <laughs> to give him the vase." <laughs> So, yeah, they obviously caught up somewhere along the line. Not in this episode, but they do mention Uncle Albert again. So, the Uncle Albert always reminds me of their Uncle Albert in the can. Yeah. <laughs> Let him out. And, and he was, was, huh? He held Tabitha. He held Tabitha. I mean, how grody. He, she left her kid alone with a hobo even after she realized. He thought he she was thought he was a family member and he was singing to her. No, even after. Even after she realized he was a homeless man, she still wanted him in a, in her house. She didn't react. Well, she way wanted him to. She wanted to give him a was. chance to turn over a new leaf, so to speak. Um, yeah, but know, she could have done that any number of ways besides pretending that he was that. And then Darren goes along with it rather than giving her some kind of like voice of reason. And it's like he's a hobo. He's a he's a robber. Like you're just letting this happen and then on top of it you don't have any concern for your actual uncle albert like what logic cool sense does that make this one really <laughs> set you off didn't it jess i don't know why <laughs> but it really did it, it, it was just so so frustrating it was such a simple thing that they could have resolved with a phone call or something you know i feel like yeah well, they could have been honest what i found most disconcerting wasn't that was did you notice like because they have like astral turf carpet, don't they, in the house? But by the door, there's this great big white square, and it's there for the next couple episodes. It's like, why? Well, I, like, I didn't notice that. Part the carpet or something. And it's like because, and it, it, that kind of bothered me because you do that. That white square is there for the next couple episodes. So I don't. So I don't. I'm thinking to myself, like, what the hell happened? Because the carpet used to go all the way to the front door, didn't it? Well, now maybe it's like that part that for God knows what. Well, years. that's sort of like from we're back from the northeast. You got that part of you know linoleum that's right there by the door, as opposed to ruining the rug that you take your shoes off on that people do. Let's see, it wasn't there before. It isn't. It's, it doesn't appear until after they stole in the furniture. And it's like, did they steal that part? Okay, of the yeah, I did see. Yeah, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah, that is weird. Yeah, and then when they get all, and then when they get all the stuff back. It's like they don't get the carpet back. It's like, it's like that kind of bothered me for the next couple episodes. It's like that <laughs> <in that carpet. laughs> I mean, I'll have to a, pay better for it. I noticed like, it, but it kind of went like shooting over my head, and I just thought, I guess it's supposed to be there. I didn't think nothing of it. So now I guess I'll be anal and have to go look at it and see what the hell, you know. Well, you know, I think of what it is is because. Bewitch. I mean, when I used to watch Bewitch, I used to catch it like once a day and do like an episode or something. And then, you know, I don't know if I don't think I've ever watched them in chronological order anyway. Me neither. But, but now, because of this, what happens is like the night before that week or the weekend before we record this, I watch all of them in succession. So, you know, to watch one after the other, just throw the disc in and let it play. And it's like, it's kind of weird seeing <laughs> like so many together and you're kind of like noticing things up in there. Well, our next episode is episode 33 It's Divided He Falls Samantha wants to go to Miami But Darren is too busy with work (laughs) Dora then splits Darren into two One serious side and one playful person So that Samantha could take her vacation Samantha tires of his fun side While Larry and a client, Frank Maxwell Become annoyed by his overly serious side this was filmed in March 8th, 1966, and was remade in season six of Samantha's Better Halves, the first episode of the film featuring Dick Sargent. In 1997, TV Guide ranked this episode number 48 as its 100 greatest episodes of all time list, and this episode was a parody of the rerun show in two in 2021. No, 2002, sorry, the rerun show, which I've never seen, so. 
There you go. Um, so, Jesse, what do you think of Divinity Falls? I liked the concept. <laughs> I knew it. it. I love this episode. So, go but ahead, Jess. Take the I piss out of it. <laughs> I, I like the concept of it, but I was disappointed with the direction it went. Because I'm like, I feel like, I almost feel like it was kind of a propaganda episode for like propaganda people episode. people who need yeah for like the working man or something he needs to work and he's not allowed to have fun having fun is irresponsible having fun is bad being a fun person is annoying and just i felt like it could have been done in a in a way that was a little more not, I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but there, it just it, the resolve wasn't that exciting or I thought it was funny. And I don't know. I felt like I thought it was funny too, but it's like I don't know. I felt like it could have been better. And I'm trying to think of like I, I think Dick Martin was brilliant. <laughs> was Dick Martin? I thought he was excellent. I thought he was. I thought he was, the acting was exceptional, and just just he was exhausting just watching because you don't see him get that that much enthusiasm in his role as much as he did in this one i mean because he's just driving everybody nuts with the fun 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 you know fun fun well, all except all except for the young kids they love him they think he's fantastic and then samantha decides like you know he, d- he jumps off the um diving board and yeah samantha, he goes, okay, this, this not and because he jumps on his back and they're like oh god you're brilliant again she's like oh my god what have i done <laughs> And he kept asking for magnums of champagne. Let's get another magnum. I got another magnum coming. Can we afford this? <laughs> I also noticed that Dick York has a Kim Kardashian arse on him. <laughs> He's not quite a big ass on me, Dick. <laughs> I didn't notice. I'll have to check it out, I guess. <laughs> yeah, got, I don't know. It might be the cut of the child or something like that, but it's like, no, he's got a, quite a big ass on him. But I, I thought it was quite nice to see Darren let you know, go. The, over, the overworking Darren, I have to there say we've seen it over and over again, but seeing right. the fun side Darren but kind of really sizes us up because, you know, just, it just, and also looked like he was having a lot of fun with it as well. Yeah. So, you know, something well, a change. It was a little change up for him too, you know. I, all actors probably want to explore everything they can on, and, you know, in that kind of situation and show. You know, like Victoria but, Mulkey. I mean, like, like you know, Alexander Mulkey wanted to be a vampire in Dark Shadows, but they never let her. You know, that kind of thing. I also like the resolve about how to get them back together. How they <laughs> they run into each other. Yeah, that was funny. That <laughs> didn't they remind I you of? Uh, I love. What's Freaky that Friday. movie? Huh? Freaky, yeah. Freaky Friday. Friday. Yeah. I'm wondering if that's where they got their idea, kind of. I love Endora's jokes in this one. Her jokes in in this are so funny. The way that her and the fun, fun, fun Darren, like, get it on and have, like, yeah, so funny. Mother! It's like, you really love No, it was mine. I called her mom. (laughs) And then he kept telling her how beautiful she was. She goes, I like him this way. (laughs) She goes, let's keep it. (laughs) And I love her clothes. And Dora's clothes are brilliant during this. She's just <laughs> classy. I mean, who, I don't know who was dressing her, but it was just classy all the way around. I think some of them were actually her own clothes because I know for a while they did have to bring their own clothes. I don't know if she did throughout the show because it's so similar to like, it's consistent with most of the wardrobe that she's ever worn on the show. Right. So I feel like it might be her own wardrobe, which is cool. That means she has some, some style. Because she's the only one that dresses like that in the show, for the most she's part. She's really the only one that gets a chance to really have a lot of diversity in her dress. Did you notice that? Because not everybody... Samantha has typical housewife stuff on, for the most yeah, part. Yeah, which is sad. But you it's know, what, what's kind of neat, though, is because back then they used to dress up to go everywhere. They would dress up to go True. to lunch. They would dress nice to have dinner. I well, can't even imagine. just regular clothes were button ups and um, like dress pants. Like that was just a normal yeah. thing. They didn't have like t-shirts and jeans like we do. They didn't wear their pajamas to go to Walmart like we do. I mean, I don't do that. I would never do that. <laughs> but yeah. I just find it interesting how they face it with you in your onesie and, and the, you're getting your um, you know, your packet of um, biscuits and orange juice at Walmart. I've seen it. Yeah. <laughs> no, that was a romper. <laughs> oh Jesse likes rompers. <laughs> Ew, yeah, and I was sucking in my pacifier. You Jess. <laughs> we like to pick on Jesse. He's our baby. Yeah. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I, I mean, I, another thing I guess with Andorra is, is that because Andorra's got her typical outfit that we see. You know, almost She's got a, you know, she has her traveling outfit, you know. She's a woman of the world. <laughs> Where but does she I find her? In regular clothes, in regular, in normal clothing outside of her Andorra outfit. Her, her you don't Andorra see her outfit. in button ups, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, it's not. I think it's just because kind of, even the hair is different and everything, isn't it? The hair is always like very stylish and pinned well, and the, even and it's kind of weird because the makeup does stay the same on her eyes and stuff like this, but it, but it does look well, totally that, different. Than well, that blue swirl, you know, remember the blue? All girls had the blue eyeshadow phase, and you know, I think that happened because of you know Elizabeth Taylor and Cleopatra. I think that's really Probably. where the blue eyeshadow craze came from. Because, I mean, if you can achieve it and make it look that good, you can still get away with it. You can. But a lot of people just well, can't get away with that. Every time I see blue eyeshadow, all I can think of is that um, that film with Macaulay Culkin called My Girl. Yeah. And, um, oh, my God. And, and, and Klumsky's in, like there, and um, J- J- Amy Lee Curtis is doing her makeup, and she's putting blue eyeshadow. Yeah. A girl can never wear enough blue eyeshadow. <laughs> yeah. Can never wear enough blue eyeshadow. But whenever I think of blue eyeshadow, I, that line I always talks about. Girls can never wear enough blue eyeshadow. <laughs> well, blue like, eyeshadow yes, was can. a staple of every tweenies. You know, everybody had their, their. My father used to get so I I I would bypass the blue and just go straight to turquoise. My dad goes, "Man, did you take that shit off your face? Because you know, it just really looked bad." But we thought it looked good, so. No counting for taste. But it, does, but it does suit her, though. I mean, the way that is. I don't, I don't think anyone, not many people get away with that. No. Music. She I has like a very her. curated look, as if she spent, like, decades, like, coming up with this, with this look. And actually, the reason why she has her hair red, because Agnes Moorhead has, like, her actual hair is not naturally that color. I think she dyed it because of her husband, because they were so close, and... I don't know, she had like a deep admiration for him and they were like really in love. So she she wanted her hair for some reason to match his. So I think she oh, stood dying her hair red, red and never so. And she just never turned back from the red because it was just I don't know. Fitting. I, I read that somewhere. I don't know if that's a hundred percent accurate, but th- that's what I remember from the story I read. Number is that um she also I mean she comes from the Orson Welles theater group. That's where she comes right. from. Right. She's Disney King, the Magnificent Albrons, you know, all that stuff. She's from there. But um, but she's from a Pentecostal. She's Pentecostal. No. That's so bizarre. She's also no, a no, farmer. No. <laughs> yeah, no, she's like, a celebrity. She was a farmer. So when and so the so when like when religious groups are attacking Bewitched, not during Wild of Run, but afterwards, and you know, the old, you know, bollocky thing they're saying. And they said, well, she's Pentecostal. And if she thought that there was anything anti-religious about the show, she would not have done it because she had very strict beliefs. Well, actually, I wouldn't even think a Pentecostal would be, even be an actor, you know? Yeah. So, you think um, so, yeah. But she, I mean, her, her father was like head, head of the Pentecostal church as well. It's quite interesting. Well, and we're, su- we're assuming that she stuck with it. Does she say what her beliefs were yeah, as an no, adult no, she, she she stayed pentecostal the day she died she i think oh, even when okay. she died, she had a pentecostal um, funeral yeah. so she had quite she was quite strong in her beliefs sort of thing so i have to admit that if we were friends with her i bet you she didn't i don't think she suffered full gladly did she i think she's very professional but you know if she didn't like you i think that'd be it for you and <laughs> Because the thing is, she tried to get out of Bewitched because she didn't want to continue. Because she did the pilot, didn't think that it was going to last. She didn't think it was going to be a hit. She thought, I'll get my paycheck, I'll go on and move, do something else. Um, and of course, it, you know, it carried on and on and on, sort of thing. But, um, but um, it's because of her love of working with Elizabeth Montgomery and uh, Dick York, that's the reason why she stayed. <laughs> Next one is episode 34, Man's Best Friend. <laughs> Rodney, played by Richard Dreyfus, is a teenage warlock in love with Samantha. Oh, who tells beautiful. him to leave I know. and to be married. Rodney decides to leave only if he feels Darren is worthy. He turns himself into a dog to check up on Darren and goes on to a systematic campaign to break up Samantha and Darren. In the end, Darren turns the tables on Rodney. What do you think of this episode, Vix? 
This one I got a really big kick out of just because of the dog. Well, one was Richard Dreyfus. I didn't know he was on an episode of Bewitched. That's why I was texting Keith. I go, hey, Richard Dreyfus is on Bewitched. I go, I didn't know he did an episode of Bewitched. And there's another one coming down that was surprised me too, that he was on there as well. I mean, because I just wasn't expecting it. So it was kind of a pleasant surprise. And it's, he kind of, I don't know who he reminded me of. Um, he used to play all the, oh God, maybe not him, but it, it was just, it just seems like everybody that comes on the show, whether they're in love with Samantha or not, or if they're a relative or not, they always want to see if Darren is worthy. How many trials by fire does this guy have to go through? You know, and then he not loves enough. this dog. He thinks this dog is a stray. He's loving on this dog and it's, and it's this warlock the whole time. And, you know, and Samantha's being mean about the dog and he's not understanding why she hates the dog so much. But I mean, it was a really cute episode. I liked it a lot. And I really enjoyed seeing Richard Dreyfus. Got how old was he? You know, ten. He, about yeah. ten. he looks so young. Well, the he funny thing ten. about Richard Dreyfus, though, did you notice his acting style? Was, was so cemented in this episode that it never changed <laughs> no i mean the same the same tone i mean the yeah. same mannerisms i mean you could have took the young richard dreyfus and thrown him into jaws and he would have done the same thing <laughs> only he's got gray hair and jaws but i mean you're right i mean it is a solidified right from this episode of his whole career you know, but I mean, I really enjoyed seeing him on this because I did not expect that. I don't remember everything because I used to watch this when we were little, you know. Well, you know, this is also directed by Bernay um, Slate. He does all the directing of all the Aunt Clara episodes. And what I quite like about it is the, the little small touches that are in this episode. Like, for instance, when the dog gets into the cake and then he switches, <laughs> then he switches into Richard Dreyfus, And, then and he's he got the it, chocolate on his face. Chocolate. But then when he goes back to the dog, you see the chocolate on the dog where his on the dog's face. I yes. thought little things like that. And I also like the the turning of the tables. Like, oh, here Darren is going not believing Samantha again, and then you find yeah. out he actually does believe. And I thought that was a nice twist because you don't see that very often. Yeah, but, but he agree. did know. But he did believe her actually, though. It's towards the end, and he, he was, was trying he to was get rid of the dog in front of. The, yeah, he was pretending for the dog's sake because he didn't want the dog or the warlock. But he, he gave that little, he no he gave, a little gave a little bit of a twist in this episode. Though, so for a little here, because you kind of think, like, okay, he doesn't believe her uh, yet again, and here we go. Yeah. Well, you know, well, because that happens episodes, so much. Right? And they've been doing that in the past few episodes where Darren's actually been letting her use witchcraft a little bit more, which is why I was kind of disappointed that the beginning of this episode was like rewarding her for not using her witchcraft. For was almost this the month. episode? Where she wasn't yeah. using her witchcraft. Okay, yeah, yeah that's right. He comes on the scene a whole right month, after, thirty days. And I thought that was so weird. It's like, well, where have you guys been for like the past few months? Because we just watched your last two episodes, and she was doing magic, and you were okay with it. And I, I just don't like that he's so controlling of her doing magic, and doesn't like to have her relatives over. Like to that point, not just her not doing magic, but he doesn't want any of her magical relatives popping. Like that's isolating her from her her family from people she knows and that just seems a little too weirdly restrictive like if you as a person had a spouse that was just restricting you from being able to see your family because they didn't like them that would be considered abusive behavior so i don't know after seeing that um progression to see that j- just in the beginning and and feel like you're going backwards kind of feels like a disappointment even though the rest of this episode was really good i was kind of disappointed that that it started out that way because he seemed fine with it well he does that though a that. lot throughout a lot of the episodes i can't remember when when dick Sargent comes in if he's quite as bad i mean he i think i, I can't remember now i don't get- remember in my mind, Dick Sargent always comes across as more neurotic for some reason. Yeah. I always no, thought I Dick York agree. was more neurotic. I thought he always threw the best tantrums. I thought he always threw the best tantrums, but they're all, I mean, to be honest, to be fair to Dick York, there is a reason behind it because it's normally that when the family does come, he is kind of the butt of all the horrible stuff that's going to happen in the episode. So, I mean, so I can understand to a certain extent, but at the same time, you know, I think you also have to look at Samantha to a certain extent. I mean, you think that, you know, there are, I mean, to be honest, I think they're both kind of guilty here because let's face it, I mean, you know, Dick, your, I mean, Darren should probably never tell Samantha, you know, her family's not wealthy. That's a, one thing. But at the same time, 
Samantha should tell her family that when you come into her house, you need to respect Darren and me. But then again, if they did, we wouldn't, wouldn't have, have any fun. <laughs> the whole point is to, you know, to have that constant abrasive interaction. Yeah. Because, I mean, if I was married to Samantha, and let's just then say that every time her family popped in, and then basically, you know, they were they were turning me into animals or inanimate objects or making act or trying to ruin my job or whatever. I mean, I'd probably be a little bit paranoid. But at the same time, if Darren was okay with Samantha being a witch and okay with her using her magic, they wouldn't be turning him into parents. They wouldn't be doing these things to him. But because he's against it, they're rebelling against him by turning him into things because because yeah. they want to show him they have the upper hand. But if he was, oh, if he respected them, they would likely learn to respect him, even if they didn't, you know, initially. But he never warms up to them, so they never warm up to him. <laughs> I think the episode, when we get to 36, I think this kind of explains more of that whole dynamic between the two of them. About I hope the, so. I feel, like yeah. they, I feel like they need to explain it a bit more, especially after having it drag on for so long. Because you think, you would think at, some point you know in their marriage because they've you're assuming they've been married for at least a couple of years or so that they would let off a little bit uh, but they don't really it's they try to be consistent with their dynamic and i don't know i feel like i mean does, does that happen in real life like do people just consistently hate each other or do they eventually i was up? married once <laughs> <laughs> um I, the thing is i think at the end of the day that you know, first of all, I mean, it's a show, so you need to kind of have that a little bit of friction going on anyway to make the show carry on. But I think, I think what makes Bewitch work is that there is a true love between Darren and Samantha. There's, there's a, an unconditional love there, sort of thing. And I think that with, you know, you know, I think we'll touch on it in the, the um, in not next episode, but the episode after that. I think we'll be able to touch on it a little bit more clearly. But I think that there. That basically it's like, you know, what's the sense of having something if you don't work for it? And that's kind of the message that we got here. And I don't think that Darren, I think, I think Darren appreciates Samantha's thingy, but I think it's more of a male ego because he wants to be the breadwinner for the family. He doesn't want to yeah. live off the money that she can zap in. She, he doesn't want, you know, he kind of wants a bit of normality. But, you know, we do see Darren... You know, especially, you know, a few episodes that we've seen so far that he does let her do the witchcraft thing and sort of thing. That when it's going to well, half the time, it's them, the witchcraft but... that screws everything up. So it's going to take witchcraft to put everything back to right. So he well, almost that's... doesn't have a choice. Also about not using witchcraft for financial gain. I think that's some of it as well, which is what, right. we, come into, which is what we come into um, in the next, not this next episode, the episode after that. Our next episode is The Cat Napper, which is episode 35. Charlie Leach is back. Uh, yeah. And again, and back so soon. soon. Darren's clients into a cat. She does it because the client, Tony Devlin, is a very attractive woman and Dora suspects the worst. Charlie steals the cat and offers to return her for $1 million. Samantha decides to teach him once and for all not to mess with her, and Sam needs to convince Andorra to turn Tony back into a human being, all before Darren and Tony's important business meeting. Jesse, do you want to take this one? <laughs> <laughs> Jesse's going to just take the piss out of this one, too. I can just tell. Go ahead, Jess. I kind of want to. I kind of want to. It's just kind of all over the place, I feel like. And it's weird that they bring him back. I, 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 I think these next two kind of have trouble following a little bit because there's so much going on it's kind of contrived because you have like i mean just having charlie leach back would be an episode all to itself and that i think would take up a big chunk of time but then they add like a subplot and that is also kind of a lot of stuff going on too like that would typically also be just a plot on its own as we've seen in previous episodes where Dora turns one of his co-workers into a cat or you know samantha turns well let's let's figure out how this all came to be though because you know they go in to have lunch 
as yeah. Samantha and Endora, there's Darren with this attractive <laughs> yeah. woman who's already said that she's, you know, not into any of that. Why she thought Darren was being forward, maybe because he had his arm around her. But it's a business lunch. And Dora, on the other hand, doesn't buy it. So she turns the woman into a cat because she thinks Which Samantha is not what being... We've been, what we've been down this road before as well. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. When Maybe. she turns herself into... Um, what the hell is that bird? It's not It's not a flamingo. It's a falcon. falcon. No, no, no. no. Pelican. pelican. That's what it is. Yeah, she turns herself into a pelican. And that was a very similar episode where they were um, get a female client and they went on a boat lunch or boat dinner, I guess it was. Because right. Because late night and i just find it interesting because this is a lot about endora you, you can tell she's lived through centuries of essentially being cheated on by maurice and yeah so <laughs> she true. comes from that place like she just instantly assumes that is what's going on and because she's also protective of her daughter she just kind of initially tries to you know she, she jumps to her impulses and turns people into cats. Or, so this guy you know, goes just to happens there. again to be sitting outside the window and sees this <laughs> cat that was once a woman. Yeah. Well, I, mean, I, mean, I think this is what the problem with this episode is. Is First of all, is like she turns the person into a cat after she appears and says that she, uh, that she needs to see Darren at Darren's house. And, they're not, and Darren and her are not going to go off somewhere to have a meeting. They're going to have it there in the living room. So she turns them into a cat. So first of all, he's thinking, okay, well... If they're having an affair, they're not going to be doing it in front of Samantha, especially in the house. And then you have, so you got, you got that going on, but then you got the detective who wants to blackmail Samantha, but doesn't catch Samantha doing a spell, catches Andorra doing a spell, which would have been a very interesting dynamic that haven't tried to blackmail Andorra. But we don't yeah. get that. We get Andorra exactly. that disappears off the episode. I know. Else. The very I was hoping I was hoping he was gonna blackmail Endora too. I would have loved for them to have a confrontation because oh that would have been so satisfying. Even more satisfying than when she's doing things to Darren, you know, because he deserves it entirely. Because <laughs> he's such a, a leech. Obviously that name was intended. <laughs> yeah, and it's right. kinda like and, and it's like yeah, I I think it's, it's a messy episode sort of thing. I mean a little bit. Would, yeah. Yeah. You could have had either the storyline where it turns into the cat and the cat runs off to God knows where, which we've actually seen that before anyway. Or Charlie blackmailing Endora this time would have been a fantastic episode. But no, he, he steals the cat to blackmail Samantha, even though Samantha w- didn't do the spell. It was Samantha's mom who does the spell. So it's kind of like, okay, so well, you don't have Well, she can't any- undo it. So she has to have Adora back, and she finds her in Tibet. Isn't that where she finds her? Well, that was the, yeah. the best bit of this episode is when she's in Tibet. Yeah. And she's doing that, you know, you know. <laughs> she's done that chant. <laughs> she oh, yeah. Like, yeah. That was the best part of the episode. So basically, you had you know, had two minutes of episode that's kind of like, this is a bit messy and all over the place. And then you got her. And then, then the, the, the only other good scene in here is Leech's wife, and he goes in something about um, uh, she 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 has one she has or her one wise crack moment, which is fantastic. Which like you know, I think he goes, oh, he goes, oh, we don't have to live through that again. She goes, oh, I wish I could say the same thing or something like that, which was funny. Right. But the rest of the episode was very messy. I just thought, okay. <laughs> well, she hadn't changed her her stripes or whatever too much. The the wife there. That's married to Charlie. Yeah, I mean, I love the wife and I like the dynamic. Um, but I also think that the episode would have been better if he got rid of the her turning turning that person to a cat, and then having yeah. the detective blackmailing Endora. That would have yeah. been excellent. But Endora would have just popped him off somewhere into a space odyssey somewhere he wouldn't have gotten near as far with endora as he would have samantha because she's and that would have been enough that would have been enough that would have been sufficient as far you as see you know, endora I, irritated by mortal it's always the best part of these episodes whichever she gets annoyed by mortal than this and just say they can get something really clever about like this like this cat and mouse kind of you know checkmate sort of thing playing chess the two of them you know sort of thing and just trying to outmaneuver each other and you know and that kind of thing and yeah, and Dora would have played with him. Yeah. And Dora would have played with him in a very satisfying way, knowing that she had full power. She wouldn't have to worry about being blackmailed by this doofus. I mean, come on. 
<laughs> she just would have like put him on Mount Everest or dangled him in a seabed of sharks or something, you know, just fun stuff like that. That would have been fun to see. Well, because I mean, all we got basically is a rerun of part one and part two. So we got a rerun of that. And then we yeah. got this one. Yeah, so we got another rerun episode that's going to be cemented together. And it's, like, it's so soon. It's so soon. It's not even like next it season might have been or a like 20 soon. episodes. Yeah. I'm just wondering like, what the writers were thinking. <laughs> I have to admit. It's yeah, almost this, like, this episode and the next um, one feel muddled. We got this actor who's going to play Charlie Leach and um, we, we signed him for uh, three episodes. We need to get him. We need three episodes right now. Let's film now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... Uh, wasn't maybe, this one two maybe, parter? Maybe. No, this was a one parter. No, it, the it, last, no, it, no the, it, the, feel, it, this episode actually felt very long as well. I sat there going, "God, is this episode over yet?" <laughs> so, what, yeah. Was the first one two parter? I, I thought there was the a two parter of some yeah. kind. Yeah. That, that's what I was thinking. Yeah, the first one was a two parter, and then I mean, this one is basically like the third part to that one. Basically, so I don't know. They they could have just had these episodes in one after another instead of. Yeah, instead of having it like later on down the line, because it feels weird that way. And kind but of the whole point is that they've it. had some time pass and he's back. So not enough time for the audience. Though. <laughs> <laughs> way too soon. Now the next episode is what every young man should know. Uh, which is episode 36. Although Darren tells Samantha that he would have married her if she, if he knew ahead of time that she was a witch, Samantha isn't totally convinced. And Dora sends Darren and Samantha back in time to find out. I thought this was a brilliant episode. I the like way this, this all one too. Out. This is probably um, my favorite episode. But poor Dora, she has how many times did she do that incantation to send them back? <laughs> and I thought they were going to like skip it the last time, but she did it all three times. To send Darren back. Well, let's see. What, let's set it up. What happened first was that Samantha didn't think that Darren would have married her had she told him she was a witch before he proposed because she well, told him. Well, that plants plant that seed first. Yeah. So they had to figure that all out. And Darren, of course, always did fl- come through with flying colors because it's a hard episode to explain, I guess. It was, what I found, there's a couple of things I found interesting is, is that this actually explains Darren's ideologies a little bit better. So we, I think we get to know Darren a little bit better. Because the first time, you know, they go back. And another thing what I found interesting is that they zap them back. They go back to the present. Right. And so, see, I told you, I told you, it's like, well, no, you didn't let the story play out. And, um, and what we find out is that Darren does freak out at the beginning, which I guess would be understandable. You're like, whoa. I need reality check. And then he comes back and then Larry, and then we find out that Larry would have found out if it played, if, if he told her before. That means Larry would have. You knew Larry was going to want to use her to make money. You knew it. You knew that that was coming. He's, he's kind of. He's he like the Roger team. Healy. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But what, but what you did find out though, is that if that was the case and basically Samantha would have, would not have married Darren if that was the case as well. Right. We've also found that that's if she was, you know, going to be like the breadwinner or be able to zap things or whatever like this. We now found out that she would not have been happy with that. At all. We find out that as well. So now we know that the reason why she's up for being this whole mortal wife situation is that she doesn't want to be the exceptional one. She wants to. She wants to kind of meet Darren in the middle, sort of thing. Well, because- I also think she doesn't want to be exploited because she wants to be a person outside of just being a, a witch or a moneymaker. She wants to be seen as a, well, as a human being or a person, I guess you could say. Well, um, actually, I guess, I guess, I guess she's an immortal. So technically she's not human. Maybe be seen as an equal person. on equal footing, maybe. Yeah. Well, we also, but we also, which also makes me think that basically what's happened is she's dated men before and they basically have taken the piss. The yeah. Piss, hmm. Sort of thing. And I That'd think that's interesting. To see like her per- her personal life before like all of this, I, I kind of wish you could see some of that, even if it was like a flashback episode or something. But you don't really get any of the before. Like this is as much as you get to see of them before. Well, she dated warlocks. We all know that. Yeah, we know thing. that much. But you don't get to see that. You just have evidence of that. 
Yeah. Um, when they pop in, they and say, you have to wonder, two. knowing Samantha yeah. as the character she is, what was she doing with some of these warlocks? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, she was really young that, and but arranged. Was interesting that it kind of gave us an insight of why Samantha wants to do the whole mortal thing with Darren. Now we know. I think just kind of just give us a bit of insight into that. But we also understand that um, Darren doesn't want her to be exploited and he wants them to live. Uh, he wants to be the perfect husband in, 19, in 1960s. You know, being the perfect husband was being the, 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 you know, the person who's the provider in the family sort of thing. And, you know, the, and I, thought, I thought this episode was very, very interesting because it did, it did kind of flush things out a little bit better. So you kind of understand why Samantha is in, in the marriage, first of all. And why and why she's made the decision, and we also kind of understand more of Darren, the reason why he is just the way he is, the way he's anti uh, witchcraft sort of thing, because he does want to be provided, he wants to provide for. Because he tells her in this episode, he goes, he goes, I want, you know, I want to be the one that's gonna, you know, provide for you. I want to be the one to take care of you. And and he and he do get that. And I thought that this episode was very very cleverly done because we kind of, it kind of, it kind of. Out of all the episodes, I mean, you know, we've done season one. We're almost, we're almost at the end of season two now. And this is the first episode that kind of flushes them out, really. A little bit, anyway. Funny. And you know, but you know, we and we do get Andorra kind of going, "Yeah, I told you so. I told you so." But then it's like, you know, and then they have to go back, and it's, and that's another interesting thing is, is that it is a sliding doors kind of situation as well, which I quite like. You know, where basically it's like, you know, if you left us ten minutes later on your day, your day could be totally different. And it's kind of right. that scenario. And I quite like that. It's like playing with time. Even though that anything that's happening when they go back in time is not really affecting the present in any way, sort of thing. So but yeah. I thought it was fun though how you how they had that, you know <laughs> because you did wonder what if what if Darren knew before he proposed. So I mean it it was it I thought it was one of the better episodes. I really enjoyed it because I love watching Dara. Well, she could so Dora keeps sending him out of the door and blasting him like downstairs. And he keeps coming back because he's going to keep fighting for his relationship with yeah, Samantha. So. Samantha's got someone who's going to always come back no matter what for her. And that's, that's quite a, that's, I thought that was quite decent. And another thing I also found interesting is that when, it, when he meets in Dora for the first time in this alternative um, path, he calls her mother. And she doesn't yeah. like that anymore. And I thought, oh, okay, mom. mom, mom, she called her. Yeah, he goes, hey, mom. I think mother would have been left because she, Samantha calls her mother and he, he says, mom, which is like, that, at that point, that was the modern way of saying mom, I think. I don't know. If, I wonder if in the 60s, everyone just called their mom, mom, or if that was. My kids kind of only like, call me mother when they're irritated. It's ma or mom any other way, so. Uh, yeah, I think this. I think this is well written and I'm well acted, and it, it flushed things out. And I really, I actually really enjoyed this one. Like, I about, did. This it gave a, a little insight and a little backlighting to the relationship. Finally, I think this is you know for me. I think this is one of the best. Some, one of the best episodes I've seen. Really, That's you know, I think it, I think it would have been interesting if this had been a two parter instead of having like that really dumb gangster one a two parter because. I would have liked to see them start back a bit further because I feel like I feel like doing it this way kind of captures the dynamic of the way that Darren and Samantha's relationship is now once they're married more than it does when they're both single and dating. Each well, not single and dating, but before they're married and they're still dating. I, I kind of wish they'd gone back to that, and I feel like setting that up in an, a prior episode before this plot would have been fun to see. To have it even more flesh out if that makes sense i don't know i feel like it would be fun to see more of that yeah like when you see the first episode you see all the dates that they're on but they're just making out the whole time it would be fun to see them like act on actual dates and like meeting at the store rather than having the narrator explain it to you and have more of that context as well but i don't think you know they never do that in any other episodes it would have been fun if they had done that with this in like a two-parter i think i would have rather seen a two-part of this than the one with that um, Charlie Beach guy. I don't even think it was a week. (laughs) It was more like three days. Yeah, we we made out. Why don't we just get married? Yeah. They don't know much about each other. I mean, she waits till after they've like 
said their vows and they're on their honeymoon to say, I'm a witch. You know, these are my hobbies, you know. Maybe she likes to read tarot cards for her hobbies. He wouldn't know, you know, because she didn't they didn't have enough time to figure that out. <laughs> Now, our next episode is our last episode, which is episode 37, which is The Girl with the Golden Nose. After Larry Tate changes his mind about giving Darren an account, Darren is sure Samantha's magic is behind Larry's change of heart. His belief is strengthened with everything he wants seems to come his way, even when he tries his hardest to sabotage the situation. Darren believes Samantha is giving him a charmed life. Samantha has to find a way to show him that it was not her magic but really has confidence and talents that are getting him these things. So, Vicki, what's your thoughts of this episode? <laughs> I think, well, I think we've kind of been here before, haven't we? Yeah. With uh, He doesn't think that it's gone by his own merit, and um, he thinks that that uh, Samantha got the account for him. But was it, didn't Louise call her prior to tell her that he had already had the account and he was fine? What set him off? I'm trying to refresh my brain here. It's basically, you know, it's his own you know, ego. Well, yeah. his lack of confidence in her himself. Her pride. Amazing. Yeah. She so, wanted the coat. That's right. It was the, because of the fur coat. That's That was the catalyst for everything was that mink coat. She wanted a mink coat. And if he got this specific account, they would have more money in their, you know, in their life. And he would be able to buy her said coat. So then he what was he thought he was on a lucky streak after that. Yeah. And so then what was it? The one thing that oh gosh, my, my brain is shot today. When he was uh asking the secretary if she was born in Minneapolis by accident or whatever. She goes, No, 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 I was born in Minnesota. And then she calls up her mother and finds out, no, 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 you weren't born there. You were born somewhere else. So he thinks that. Either he's doing this or Samantha's doing it. I think he thinks Samantha's doing it and he's playing along with it because he doesn't want to hurt her feelings because she has the mink coat. Little do they know that if anybody saw that coat in the last decade, they would have dumped red paint all over it. I I mean, to be honest, you know, if I was with someone who is this insecure, I'd be like, fucking, I'm not sorry, I'd say get over yourself and bored with it now. Because it is, it's all about Darren's insecurity in this episode. Basically. And basically, it's like, I don't really like the, I, I don't, I don't mind Darren getting upset when Samantha's used their, or used their magic if something's happened. I'm okay with those episodes. I don't like it when Darren's like insecure and not, and nothing's going yeah. on. There's only insecurity. And I find that those quite episodes are so like, they, they're so drawn out. And it's like, you don't like to see these people. Who are insecure and like be around them all day let alone watch an episode about but he's got insecure. lots of reason though you know playing you know devil's advocate here he's been screwed with so much when it comes to witchcraft that i think he's but getting not- phobic or he's got ptsd or something like that's going on because he every ad campaign he's done is successful because of his talent it's been that way ever since the beginning of the show whether it's the soup ad or whether it's you know you know, changing and that was that was the other episode where he was like this and he thought Samantha had done something, which was the soup campaign, I think. The soup campaign, yeah. Yeah. And he accused Samantha started. of coming mm-hmm. up with that or putting the idea in his head. Or and so it was wasn't it was Schooner Tuna too? Schooner Tuna? Yeah. yeah. Schooner Tuna, I don't know why. That one just stuck in my head, the tuna fish one. But you know, and then I think episode thirty-seven, and so far I think we've seen you know sixty or seventy episodes of Bewitch by now. And what we know about Darren is that Darren's very good at his job, and he wins every account, and every account wins. He basically, and he's the one that keeps the accounts. So when we get an episode like this about all of a sudden he's not good, he doesn't think he's good enough, and it's like, well. You know, we've had two years of you now basically winning these accounts over and over based on your talent. You know, and yeah, I don't know. I just found it a bit like, oh, why are we going down this road? Why are we doing this? Yeah, it'd be one thing if he had just lost an account and then felt bad about it and then kind of, you know, 
waited in his sorrows for like a few minutes, but like for the whole episode, it's like, oh my God. But there's no reason for it. You got to think that this is what housewives were doing back in the day was supporting their husbands, being there for their husbands for the most part. You didn't have, you know, you know, the big time feminist, you know, anti-man movement going on yet. So, you know, and, and that, and, and she's a witch. I mean, of course, every once in a while, he's going to get a little paranoid because the whole family and in, in all this, the, all the episodes we've covered and the ones that are coming down the pike have messed with him so bad. He's paranoid. I'd be insecure, too. If people kept turning me into different shit. Well, all the time. <laughs> they saying. did have they did <laughs> have the feminist movement, though, at this point, they had that back in like. Even in the 1800s, they had forms of it. And then they had it in the 40s and the 50s. You know, there's always been like some form of feminism. So I do feel like there's maybe some some of that. Not at, It wasn't as profuse as it is now, of course. But I don't know. I feel like maybe some of that went into this. Not in this episode, per se, but in the show. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it was. I, I don't think. I don't know. Darren's supposed to be upset. He's always supposed to have. You know, I'm surprised he hasn't had a heart attack by now, tell you the truth. Well, sometimes that's what makes him unlikable, though, because I feel like, I mean, I wonder, like, at the time, how many people liked Darren versus how many people didn't like him. Because, I like, it would be interesting to know if, I know because of his position and, like, the dynamics back then, and he's supposed to be, like, you know, the breadwinner. I wonder if that was the only reason why he's like this and if other people would agree with his point of view or if his attitude towards Samantha would still be met with some kind of like oh that guy's an asshole (laughs) kind of sometimes I mean he's been better these last few episodes he started off a bit brutish at times to Samantha without reason too like you know before there were reasons for Darren to accuse Samantha of certain things now at least there have been moments where Samantha and her family have caused, you know, troubles for him. But Samantha's never been dishonest to him and done things for him behind his back. And he's accused her of that a few times before without reason, you know, because that's not something that she would do. She always tells him, at least after the fact, like she comes clean. She's, she's never dishonest with him. Right. Well, there's, there's a whole bunch of transition in this particular episode. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, you have the exiting of Gladys, you know, poor Derek uh, passed yeah. away. So there was a lot of That's stuff, so you know, maybe, you know, that, I, well, they, they probably knew she was going to pass away. I don't know if that di- that would mess up the dynamic of the rest of the the show, but. Um, I, think they, I think they scrambled around a little bit because they had to bring in Abner's system. Yeah. And obviously you can tell that that part was actually written. That was Gladys will do saying those lines because that's the way that they're written about. Right. So, um, I think I don't know how, I don't I, I think that when she got sick I think it went really quick. I don't think there was like I don't think it's like oh I'm sick and going for chemo and I'm gonna you know basically you know I think basically she was diagnosed and she was gone within two months. <laughs> I think that's what happened because it's kind of like yeah it went quickly. I mean if you look at the episode the episodes are um taped weekly or every right. Two. And when you look at the beginning of season two, I mean, she's going down quickly. And she's, she's thin. Gone. She's got a wig on. And... Yeah. And I'm talking about she's gone within seven episodes. Yeah. Four four thing. Thing. So obviously it's like, there went, and the thing is, and he, and watching it like we do, because we watch these in clumps you now. And watching it, you saw, the, you saw her like go really quickly. It's like, you know, I remember texting you going, oh my God, she's really sick. <laughs> it's just like, it was kind of, sad and quite disturbing at the same time sort of thing so yeah i don't know I, this episode i just kind of like here we go again and i mean if something yeah, happened and dora made a threat or sam made a threat or someone came made a threat or whatever there's a comment about you can't provide or you ever wonder why you know, your ads are not your ads have gotten better or something like that something really small and then this happened i would understand but nothing like that happens at all Right. No, there, there's help. nothing. There's nothing mm-hmm. like that That's whatsoever. Right. So it it is kind of out of the blue for him to and feel the way it, that he does. It just feels very whiny. He never was into minks and all that. I mean, even time that it's like, oh, we're going to get you minks. I'm not, I don't need mink, honey. I just want you. It's like we've had an episode that had that about that already. You know. Well, I think what's annoying about this and like 
I think the reason why people get annoyed with people like this in real life is because it is a form of selfishness and it's not really coming from like a place of reality. It's like a delusion where people feel unappreciated, but at the same time, everyone in their life is showing their appreciation to them and they're getting awards for the good jobs that they do, yet they still feel badly about themselves. So that really just shows that it's an issue with themselves that they have to deal with on their own. It's not something anyone else needs to or should prove otherwise. It's not up to them. And it's, you know, I, I just, I, I mean, I find it difficult to be around people like that. You just kind of have to let them go through the motions of that. And I hate when people have to cater to people who are going through this. I mean, I know that sounds probably a bit brutal to say because I know that happens. I mean, but there's only so much you can do because even if you try to say, something helpful and nice to people when they're feeling like this they're not always inclined to take your word to have any meaning it's just kind of like they're still going to feel bad about themselves you have to let them ride that by themselves so that's why i don't like seeing episodes like this because nothing samantha is going to do or andora or larry he's still going to feel like this and he's, he's just going to go to the bar and drink you know or whatever it is that Darren does <laughs> He did, did go to the bar, he didn't he? Did he? Didn't he go to the bar and he was trying yep. to? Yeah, I mean, I do think if there was a if there was a stronger reason for him to feel this way, I think it would have played off. But I think the reasoning for him to feel this way is kind of stupid because she wants. Yeah, to it, it also feels redundant too because we've already been through episodes that have done this kind of thing better with reason, and this one doesn't have a reason. It also kind of feels like the episode where Samantha and Darren get into some kind of a fight. And then he gets her like flowers and then she cries and says it's like the best gift that she, or was it a wash? I don't remember. He got her some kind of gift and she got emotional. And that episode was done much better than this one. And it feels kind of similar because she also expresses a similar sentiment, but with a little less heart than the first time around, if that makes sense. So right. I don't feel like this was met with the same enthusiasm as and you already know the that initial she's not episode. She's not materialistic. Samantha is not materialistic. That's the whole thing. Her whole right. premise exactly. is not exactly. But she does like a nice thing once in a while. And so she was looking at that code in the but ad. She would be content. She would be content without yeah. it, though. No, I mean, material, you know, it doesn't mean we're doing. We're gonna steal it. Oh, we all look at things we want and we know we can't afford or whatever, you know. It's just like yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you know. I'm just sitting there saying that the you know Samantha can look at stuff and you know go shopping and she's like, you know, she's window shopping with Darren. It's like you know, so and that you know, but it but she's not. But there's nothing. There's never been anything in this show that ever showed that she's materialistic. I mean, God forbid this lot. She's painting a fucking um rocking chair white for God's sake, where she probably could have. You know, but bought the same rocking chair already white for a cheaper price than the freaking paint that she's using. But some people but she like to up. paint. And if she was materialistic, she would have just whipped it up. That's the beauty of like being a witch is that. But it is she's kind not of supposed to. Thing. No, it doesn't. Yeah, but if she was materialistic, I don't think she would care. But she's not materialistic, so and she also cares. So I, I feel like. If you were a materialistic yeah, person, that at, at its core saying. comes from being selfish. So I feel like, I don't know, if she would be a different person if she was materialistic. It, yeah, if she just showed a little bit of materialism whatsoever, it'd be different. But she's always shown that she's not materialistic. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, you know, the whole thing about, you know, the things that she has and things that she does, I mean, not none of it's ever centered. Even when she's got, like, that designer... Um, dress on that basically is because she it wasn't even her it was her mom because she messed up on the dress that she was making for herself she was making a dress for herself that she couldn't well, probably she just couldn't sew and that's the reason why she had that dress so that wasn't even her it was her mom that did that that made it you know or it's her mom going oh let's go to uh, paris and we can do this and i'll buy you right. this because i don't need that and this is what we this is our samantha so the fine so that's why i'm saying that the the reason behind this, if it had a better reasoning, I think this episode would have played off. But what we know yeah. is not realistic at all. But it's West really Park. all just about Darren. Even when he makes it seem like it's for Samantha, it's still all about him and his pride, his ego being bruised about something within his own mind. It's kind of like a delusion that he's kind of created. It's self-inflicted. So it does seem kind of strange because it's not actually about Samantha. Samantha would have been content without the coat. 
and he's just a, he's acting like a buffoon throughout this whole episode, kind of for no reason. So it's a little agitating to watch. <laughs> it's entertainment, <laughs> Jess. It's there. entertainment. I know, I know. I but just, I just think that it makes me I mean, it also doesn't help that the episode before that was about Samantha hating imperialism and hating materialistic things, and that's what the episode before this was about. So. You know, maybe, yeah. maybe, this is like, maybe this episode was done at the beginning of season one or something like that, maybe, but, you know, we've all had two, year, two, you know, two full seasons talking about Samantha and she's not, she doesn't want all the expensive material stuff. And she says it over and over again in multiple episodes. So you're just, to Darren, she's just kind of going, okay, what's this about? But it didn't play off well for me, so... So oh, this brings us to our favorite character and our least favorite character of this block. And so starting with you, Vicky, what's your favorite character and your least favorite character of this block? Well, I had a couple of favorite characters. I really enjoyed Richard Dreyfus's performance as the teenager, the lovesick teenage warlock. But I also liked the uh, the uh, the young bimbo. Was that Nina Wayne that played opposite of uh, Foster Brooks as Dr. Yeah. Andrews, I believe? Um, I got. I, I just like the, they're they're like a tie with me because they're both. Well, she's more of a character actress, but he he was. A, I just didn't expect to see him for one, and it was really cool to see him in such an early role. And then mm-hmm. when you said, "Yeah, well, this is just remind," he he was like he's set in stone. You're right for decades, you know. Even in what about Bob? He's still Richard Dreyfus, you know. I love that movie, by the way. If you want to laugh? Watch yeah. what about Bob? No way. Yeah. Was that one where um, he's with Nico Estevez? Uh, no, that's where he's the the the, uh, the the psychiatrist. And Bill Murray keeps showing up. Yeah. He's doing very like autistic or something in that movie, or is he just like oh he's man. crazy and he keeps going? He crazy. goes, he goes, what are we gonna try? He goes, death therapy, Bob. <laughs> it's just like it's just a great movie, it really is. But, but I even mean, that, but even um, that movie, Stake Out, even the Stake Out, same yeah. that. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Nothing's changed. You're right. I would have never. I mean, he's just even. He's just solid, Richard Dreyfus. But it was just really cool to see him. I had no idea. I was really surprised. Uh, you but know, he literally rem- he he plays that role perfectly because I literally know someone that looks and acts exactly like that. Like, well, he's uh, kind of a brat even now. Yeah. Richard Dreyfuss has always been kind of a brat, and he was like that he was, when he was younger too. He was but like I that mean, in the Good Bond Girl as well. Remember that with Marsha Mason? Yes, yes, and we don't like the panties hanging on the rod. <laughs> <laughs> I love that movie. I don't know why I do. I would love to see it on Broadway. But uh, who's your least favorite character then? My least. I'm just, I mean, just I've just this isn't my favorite block so far, guys. I'm just gonna say so. I'm having my least favorite character has got to be the Charlie Charlie Leach. Leach just sums it all up. He's an annoying character. I don't. I mean, he's probably a nice man in real life back in the day. I know. But he must be doing his job well because I found him really annoying and abrasive. Very leechy. <laughs> and then he is a leech, yeah. yeah and no, I just he's probably spinning his grave because of what you're saying now. Yeah, no. But he wasn't my favorite part. And those, I wish that I, I, you know, I didn't say it. I wish I didn't see him because that's what we do. But it that was not my, it was like they were running out of steam or something in these episodes. I think if they got another actor, let's just say they got Vincent Price or Boris Karloff or Buster well, Keaton. somebody, it's sort of like Charlton, would have been interesting, Charlton Heston, actually. something, man. Yeah. <laughs> Do something here. That would be interesting. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the concept of it is fascinating. And if you had like a legitimate story, it would actually come off as pretty like cinematic, actually. Like I, I liked the concept a lot, but um the actor and the fact that it was played more for the last kind of lessened its impact i feel like so yeah mm-hmm. I, I think having a different actor might have and changing how things went might have actually made it a really good episode really hard to have a bumbling idiot go against the witch yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah it was a bit offensive in an offended world mm-hmm. <laughs> 
Peter Falk doing his Columbo bit going after Samantha. That would have been fun. <laughs> oh my God. That would have made me insane. <laughs> and what about you? So, you see your favorite character and your least favorite character in this block. I would probably also go with the leech guy. And I mean, especially because he was on like two times basically in a row. And it's like, yeah, too soon, man. Too soon. Yeah. Why are you showing your face around to her again? Yeah. And he's obnoxious. <laughs> uh, I know he's supposed to be, but... Um, that's what I'm saying. He must be doing his job well. Yeah, maybe that's it. it it's hard. But yeah, he's obnoxious, and then... Um, it has got to be someone you like that stood out to you. Oh, of course. I mean, obviously, I always like Endora. And um, for, for as far as newcomers go, I would say... I guess Richard Dreyfuss is also a good choice, because I think he did a really good job playing that... Adolescent he was a solid actor. Character. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I knew he looked familiar. I mean, aside from like, he, he looked like my cousin. Well, um, I think he played in The Graduate not too soon after this. I think he was in The Graduate, um, wasn't he? Was he in The Graduate? I, I, I wouldn't know. That's not was. I don't really like The Graduate. <laughs> Twice I never liked it. I never liked it, but I was talking about it and Scott wanted to remind me that he was in The Graduate. And I didn't even look to see if he was. I think I watched it maybe once 30 years ago. I watched it twice. And it's one of those movies everyone talks about how brilliant it is. And she's like, I just don't have a memory for that too much because I didn't really. I know everybody says it's one of the best films of all time, but I'm sorry. I just don't think so. <laughs> when people do when people say that i automatically just don't watch it I, i'll wait 10 years before i watch it make up my own mind because i i just i hate being like everyone and jumping on bandwagons just for the sake of it i don't i i think I people know. have a hard time actually forming their well own god movie. man don't tell anybody you hate anything these days they'll just jump on you like yeah. white on rice i'll be canceled not allowed i'll be to canceled not like anything. their yeah. feelings will get hurt <laughs> um no, in a favorite, corner. I'm going to say Richard Dreyfuss because I think that was a great episode. I think it had a lot it of nice little touches in it. And it's hard to believe he was that, ever that young. because I, I my, know! When I picture Richard Dreyfuss, I always picture him like in his late 20s, early 30s. Uh, I just immediately go to Jaws. That's how I remember Richard Dreyfuss is Jaws. That's how he was, you know? And he kind of stayed like that envisioned in my head ever since, you know, until he did that that part in What About Bob? And uh, my my least favorite is going to be Charlie Leach um, character, which is played by Robert Strauss again. Because I just like, I don't know. I think it's, I think the potential was there. I just don't think the acting was there. And it just kinda, didn't quite cut it. Yeah. And I, I don't. I think he might be better in a better role, but I, th- I just think they, I think they could have found a better actor to do that. That would have been more, the Max Wits a bit better. Yeah, fun. he just was, he's miscast completely, I think. So now we're at to our favorite episode of this block and our least favorite episode of this block. Starting with you, Jesse, what's your favorite episode of this block and your least favorite episode? Or of which this three block? episodes did you hate the most, Jess? <laughs> I wouldn't say I hated it. I know that's a strong word. Yeah. Um. Jeez. I. I mean. I. I like the first one. This um, is always the hardest part. Just like you just gotta. You know he's gonna ask you, so you gotta have it in your head before he springs the question. Yeah. Up. But I'll be. I'll be trying to figure it out and going back and forth that whole time too. So. Um. But yeah, I mean. It's hard because I, I didn't like the whiny Darren one. And I also thought the the divided Darren was kind of all over the place. And a few other episodes were all over the place um, with the return of that Charlie Leach guy. Uh, maybe that's my least favorite one, I think. I think that one will be my least favorite because that was annoying. And it was all over the place. Love yeah, that. I had a hard time with that one. And it didn't really, I felt like it was pointless. Like it, it didn't have a message. It was a filler episode and it just kind of, it felt a little convoluted and contrived. Right. Right. So, Which one did you like? Oh, the first one. You did like the first one. Didn't hear you. Yeah. And what about yourself? Bits? I would have to say, 
Let me see. I like the, the first one, the disappearing one. But I think I really like the one with Richard Dreyfus the most. I got two that I really liked. I like the one where Samantha has to prove herself, you know, before he, um, before Darren proposes to her. I really liked that episode because it's like the first time you see Darren actually do two different things. He's being very boring and he was being very exciting. And it was one of the more enthusiastic role, role parts that he played up to this point. So it was kind of nice to see what he would, he could do. And I'm going to have to go with what Jesse said, that third one, with Charlie Leach is like, you know, you already beat this dead horse. You know, I think I wish, like you said, that if it had been somebody else, like you, I think you mentioned red skeleton or something like that or somebody that capacity, it might have actually pulled off just a little bit better, but, uh, you know, they weren't horrible, but you know, there was just a lot of them in this block. I just, it felt like we'd already done this, I guess. Yeah. So. My it went episode, too much of the same direction. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. My favorite episode is what every young man should know. And that's the one where Samantha, what would happen if they went back in time and during right the three what? times. <laughs> but it flushed, it flushed out their characters. It gave you a bit more understanding. I thought that was quite good to make something a little more backlighting into their relationship. Things forward and give you a better understanding. But that kind of comes second to Man's Best Friend because I quite enjoyed that. It was a fun little right. It, it was a good one. Um, the one I hated the most has to be the girl with the golden nose and it's the, the whole Darren self going nuts. Lack of oh yeah yeah yeah. Uh, that would be on my least favorite, one of my least favorites as well. <laughs> um, like, oh, we've been down this road, and it, it didn't it didn't make sense. And as I said before, I think if the reasoning behind it was a bit stronger to make him feel this way, maybe. But the reasoning is really stupid and weak. So it's almost like it's, it's almost like they threw something in there. Go, yeah, yeah, whatever. Let's just go with it. And it's like not didn't give two thoughts about it. So. Right, right. Well, this brings us to the end of the Literature License Podcast. And next month, we'll be finishing off season two of Bewitched with episode number 38, which will basically be an episode that was filmed um, six weeks after the beginning of season two. And it's the last one that will be shown. It's also the last episode to be done in black and white because Blue Witch will be in color from the season three onwards. And it'll be the last appearance that we will be seeing of our dear Gladys. Because it was filmed before that. And it also has a special guest star of Jack Weston, which you'll recognize um, next month. I know. That's the one I, I, I saw that. And I go, oh, my God, that's Jack Weston. I mean, just like I love watching these actors pop up because when you're younger and you're watching it, you don't recognize that until yeah, you get to be a little older. And then with a better yeah, eye, you see you it. Watch old episodes of Parks Family and also Farrah Fawcett yes. shows. And Jacqueline Smith shows up. And then Charlotte's like, oh, my God. Have you seen Jacqueline Smith? Does she look amazing still? Yeah, so she's getting a bit cat eyed from some of the plastic surgery, but she still looks good. So she okay. looks fantastic. Now, next week will be our the eighties two for one. We'll be covering the Changeling from 1981 and John Carpenter's The Fall from 1981. And of course, we'll be carrying on that week after that with Dark Shadows. And then next month, of course, we start our Christmas festivities, which we'll be doing Greener Thoughts by John Collier, which became the musical Little Shop of Horrors. That'll be our book to screen and everything in between. So it's good night for myself and good night, Vicky. Good night, everybody. Stay safe. Good night, Jesse. Good night, folks. And we'll see you next week for the 80s, two for one, The Changeling, 1981, and The Fog by John Carpenter. Let me elucidate you here Everybody wants to be a cat Because the cat's the only cat That knows where it's at Everybody's picking up on that feline beat Cause everything else is obsolete a square with a horn makes you wish you weren't born every time he plays. But with a square in the act, you can set music back to the caveman days. I've heard some corny birds who try to sing. Still, a cat's the only cat who knows how to swing. Wants to dig a long head gig and stuff like that 
When everybody wants to be a kite When playing jazz he always has a welcome man Cause everybody digs a swinging cat Tell me, do you feel elucidated? <laughs> 